He's Charles Barkley, Hall of Famer, TNT, Inside the NBA, joining us on the program. How's morale, Charles? Well, two things, Dan. Number one, Mercedes is a great car, okay? But don't buy it if you can't afford it. Let's get that out the way, all right? <laughs> Only get a Mercedes. Mercedes is an amazing car. I've had a few in my life. But don't buy it unless you can afford it. Stop trying to impress <laughs> other people. Uh, morale sucks, plain and simple. You know, I just feel so bad for the people I work with, Dan. You know, you know these people have families, and uh, I just really feel bad for them right now. You know, these people I work with, they screwed this thing up clearly. And uh, we don't have zero idea what's going to happen. I don't feel good, I'm not going to lie, especially when they came out yesterday and said we bought college football. I was like, well, damn, they could have used that money to buy the NBA. Yeah, but it, it says yeah. that TNT Sports added college football playoff games in a five-year deal, their uh, licensing deal with ESPN. Maybe that's why they're buying this, because they don't, you know, the money they were going to use on the NBA, they got to do something with. Yeah, that's what that's the first thing came to my mind. We've never had college football, never been involved with college football. And I'm like, wait a minute, shouldn't we be spending every dime we got to keep the NBA? So morale sucks, to be honest with you, Dan. I was wondering about this. I don't know if you guys have talked about this, but you and Shaq and Kenny and Ernie, how about just form a production company and continue to shoot, continue to do the inside the NBA? Hire the personnel, keep the personnel there, continue to do it in Atlanta, and then you're able to sell that to NBC or Amazon and say, here, you already got the best studio show ready to go, keep everybody in place, but you guys own your own production company. Well, I've talked to the guys about everybody signing with my production company because I have my own production company, and uh, I want to. I, I would love to do that if, if we lose it. But I have definitely had – actually, somebody suggested that to me, to be honest with you, on the Internet. So why don't Charles Barkley sign these three guys, four guys total, this his production company and sell it? I'm like, that's a great idea. Yeah. But like I say, you know, we're just sitting back waiting on these people to figure out what they're going to do. You know, you know, my two favorite wines are Ingle Nook and Opus. And these clowns I work for, they've turned us into Ripple and Boone's Farm and Thunderbird. <laughs> like, we got the best studio show. We won. We just, and it's so funny, we just won the best studio show, but these fools turn us from Ingle Nook and Opus into damn Boone's Farm and Ripple. It's crazy. You're actually angry. I am. I, you know, Dan, it's so interesting. I've been spending a lot of time with the crew lately. I've actually. They've been with these guys where I spent time with their, they bring their newborns in. They bring their kids in. They'd come in like when they were in high school and now they're graduating from college. I mean, that's how long, you know, Ernie's been there 32 years. Kenny's been there 27. I've been there 24, but think about that. Some of these people I work with, they bought their newborns in and say hello to us. <laughs> They bought them in in high school when they graduated, and now they've already graduated from college. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm angry at people who, they're like, you know, they're part of my family, to be honest with you. So, and I feel bad for those guys. Yeah, but you how know, did because- you guys screw it up? How did, how did TNT mess this up? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, they came out and said we didn't need the NBA. So I think that probably pissed Adam off. I don't know that, but I'm saying like, you don't, because, you know, when we merged, that's the first thing our boss said, we don't need the NBA. Well, he don't need it, <laughs> but the rest of the people, me, Kenny, Shaq, and Ernie, and the people who work there, we need it. So uh, it just sucks right now. And, it, 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 and, you know, the thing that's interesting, me, Kenny, and Ernie talk about it, Shaq, all the time, like, people walk up to me, I'm not even joking, 20 times a day. I'm like, dude, thank you for the kind words. But I have zero idea what's going to happen. Yeah, hey, You know, it's funny. Like, you can't go anywhere. And then what's really frustrating, I'm getting, we all are, getting sent like five, seven articles a day about we've already lost it or we on life support. Uh, TNT's tr- trying a fourth quarter comeback. And 
I don't know Bill Simmons, who I, you know, I'm a big Bill Simmons fan. He's sending me, he's sending, they're sending us articles like it's already, they've already lost it. It's made, it's over with. I was listening to Mad Dog Russo the other day. He's like, oh, the deal's over with. It's already going to NBC. So I don't know what to believe. So uh, it sucks for the people, for all of us. Talking to Charles Barkley, the Hall of Famer, TNT's inside the NBA. Let me start with last night. Kyrie Irving, you know, he's had a quietly great year. Like, quiet off the court, played well on the court. And it's almost like this resurgence, maybe, with Kyrie that now we kind of rediscover his basketball talents there. What do you what do you see when you see Kyrie now? Well, I think it's great that people seeing what a great player he is instead of all the, the stuff that was going on when he was in, in Brooklyn and things like that. Because he's a f- unbelievable player. You know, you know, Dan, I'm really glad I went back and looked at a bunch of tape on my two off days and said, you know, because I was caught up in the excitement. I said, man, in Minnesota, Minnesota, Minnesota. But then when I went back and looked at tape for two days, I was like, damn, the Mavs going to win this series. Uh, and I still think they're going to win this series. They got a lot of severe matchup. The big guys, what's scary about that game last night is they didn't make any shots. I think they were six or like 30 from three. They're going to get wide open threes because my biggest consider a Minnesota. They got two issues that I don't like. Uh, number one, I don't think they can guard a good three-point shooting team because they play those two big guys. And secondly, Carl Anthony Town, who's a very good player, I don't think he ever used his size to his advantage. I think he yeah. shoot way. Yeah. I think he wait should always shoot too many threes because he he's the only player in the NBA gonna have a size advantage every night. Every night he plays, is he playing that four position? He's gonna have a size advantage every single night. But he never. I saw him post up more against Denver and against the Suns than I've ever seen him in his career, and he was very effective. But last night he went back to the guy that drives me crazy. He shot nine threes. And I'm like, damn, dude, you're seven feet tall. The guy you're playing against is six, seven. Every time you shoot a three, he's like, thank God I ain't got to, <laughs> wrestle, I ain't got to wrestle with this guy in the post. So that's why I like the Mavs. And, um, but I tell you what, you know, the Celtics, man, they really miss Porz- Gazingas, Gazingas, whatever his name is. Because they really miss him. Because he's the only guy who posts up. And he's the only one who shrinks the floor for Jalen and Jason. Because you have to guard him the whole time. So that's going to be a really good series. Rick Carlisle and the, and the uh, Pacers have done a hell of a job. And they gave the game away, man. I was so pissed watching that game the other night. They flat out gave that game away. Yeah. Well, you know, back to Dallas. I was surprised that they dominated in the paint. Dallas dominated Minnesota in the paint. They outscored them 62 to 38 in the paint. So you got those big guys. But they don't play big. It doesn't matter how big you are if you don't play big. And the way they play defense, they play that drop where the guy just bags up. You know what it's like? It's like when I'm betting on football and your team gets to lead and they play that damn prevent (laughs) defense. And the other team gets a backdoor cover. Yeah. That pisses me, that day, and that pisses me off every time I'm watching football. I'm like, good. We got the lead. We can't lose the game. All we got to do is stop them one more time. And they play that prevent defense. I call it prevent from winning. <laughs> and yeah, when the guy drops, when the guy drops, he's useless. He does nothing. He don't stop either play. He doesn't stop the lob. And he don't stop Luca or Kyrie from scoring. Now, the problem the Wolves got now is they're probably going to double that going forward because, you know, in every game you make adjustments. Now, what that's going to do is open up Dallas three-point shooting. They didn't make any in game one, but they're going to get the same shots they got in game two they got in game one. Just saw this. The Cavaliers have fired uh, their head coach, J.B. Bickerstaff. I I guess. Why? I have no idea. He had a nice season. You know what? Let me tell you something. I'm so disgusted with these punk ass NBA players today. The same thing happened to Darvin Ham and Frank Vogel. You know, it's always somebody else's fault. It's, it Bernie, uh, his dad Bernie is, is a great guy, yeah. but he didn't deserve to get fired. You know, they wait. His second best player was out. 
you know, so, man, that's just the NBA today. The players take no responsibility, zero responsibility. But that's the third firing, like Frank Vogel, Darwin Ham, and now Bickerstaff. But, you know, I, you know when, I inter- when I interviewed for a couple jobs uh, for a general manager, I wanted complete control. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. When did you, when's the last time you interviewed for a front office? I've interviewed for three front office jobs in the last, not, it's been a, probably about five to seven years, but I wanted complete control because I know, because as a general manager or president of bas- basketball operations, you get to fire like four guys before people realize you're the problem. <laughs> I, I do. I, I do. I think, I think, I think being a president or the GM is the best job in, in there because you're the one who picking the players and you're the one who making trades. But I think you get to scapegoat at least three, more likely four coaches because people never say, say who put this crappy ass team together. <laughs> they are, it's easier to fire the coach. And you get to hide out behind closed doors. Yeah. So that's like when I like when I interview, interview for those jobs. I'm like, yeah, this is a job I want because I got great job security. Before people realize, like, wait, you're the head coach. You get away with murder. You get to make all these bad trades and bad all these bad decisions. But if you fire the coach, it kind of shot clock like starts on you again. So that's the best job in sports, being a GM in the NBA or president of basketball operations. What were the teams that you interviewed with? I'd rather not say that because I don't want people to know I was talking about coaches behind their back, to be honest with you. Okay. What about if somebody said right now to you? Do you want it's, to- probably too, it's probably too late okay. for me now. Okay. Uh, it's probably too late because I want to do that in my 50s. I'm six, I just turned 61, so... I probably wouldn't do it now, to be honest with you. Well, shit, I might not have a job. So I, I know, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you you got a lot of free time, perhaps, coming up. Hey, hey you know what? Dan, I, you, hey, I love you, Dan. <laughs> you know, when I put my resume on LinkedIn the other day, they called me back and said, <laughs> you've never had a real job. Why, what, I said, I said, you don't have a resume. I don't. That's what I said. When I put my <laughs> when I put my stuff on LinkedIn the other day, they're like, have you ever had, like, a real job? I said, nope. Wait, wait, when you're growing up, did you work like at Dairy Queen or Pizza Hut or any of those places? No. I'm in a small town, Dan, a couple thousand people. There's no Dairy Queen and all that stuff in Leeds, Alabama. I've never, as you know, that's what's really funny. And I'm lucky and blessed. I want to make that clear. I've actually never had a real job, Dan. Can you believe that? Good for you. Good for you. Lucky. Hey, I'm lucky. Yeah, you're going to go wire to wire without having a job in your life. I was going to hey, ask you. I hope so. The the five I can make an argument. The five best players in the world are f- not from the United States, right? So I could I could give you Luca, I could give you Jokic, I could give you Giannis, I could give you Shea Gilgis, and I could give you Joel Embiid well, easily. And you know what's funny about that? I've been pushing the NBA. For the last, you know, the, the, the All-Star game sucks. I've been pushing for the last probably seven years. United States against the world. Are there think, enough good players, though, with the world? Now, I gave you five. I got to get about. You didn't, you didn't mention Rudy Gobert. Um, he's he's not from this country. Who else? I'm trying to think. Yeah, I'd see, have to, uh, see, that's uh, the uh, problem. I, I well, think no. we're top heavy. Yeah, the we are top heavy, but you know, there's some other players. I mean, I don't have the list in front of me, but you know, like I say, um, Pascal a, Siakam. Yes, Pascal Siakam. Um, Laurie Markinen. You know, Laurie Markinen. <laughs> uh, we have to step. We have to. I mean, think about it, Dan. We got seven you know or eight. I, you know what I think the NBA is afraid of? That the United States would lose. I know. I, I, I do. I was like, yo, man, the All-Star game sucks. So I could get, like, Franz Wagner. Uh, oh, yeah. Both of the Wagner brothers. Yeah, sure. They're All-Stars I mean, now. Dan. Josh we gotta, Giddy. Josh, uh, come on, man. We got to know players. <laughs> but I think, I, think, I think Adam, you know, I love Adam. I, I love him a lot. He's a great dude, Adam Silvia. But I think they're afraid the United States will lose. Yeah, that, but this goes I, back to you guys in the Dream Team. Because if I go back, this is 32 years ago for the Dream Team and the impact that it had. And I remember David Stern saying that to me, that this, will, this is about globalization. This is our right. best players the world will be able to play against our best players 
and then it will force them to go back to improve. And it turned out to be true. Well, that's why I think David Stern is the greatest commissioner ever. He made the NBA what it is today. It's a global game. You know, when we go overseas and play, there's 50,000 people in these arenas. That's the genius of David Stern's. Uh, he, uh, he made it, you know, when I talk, you know, it's so crazy. You know, one of my, my favorite people of all time is Dirk Nowitzki. And we had him on the show a couple of weeks ago. He was great. He was great. He, yeah. He's just a great person though. And he was telling this story that the reason he wears 41 is because of me. Cause you know, on the dream team, I had number 14 and Robert Pack wouldn't give him 14. So he wore 41 and he told, <laughs> and, and I, and I, and I knew the story. Um, and, and Dirk, like I say, Dirk, man, he wasn't just a good dude. And you tried to get him to Auburn, didn't you? I did. I tried to, I, well, you know, it's so funny. We were playing like Nike had always taken us to different countries every year. And Dirk's got like 31 at halftime against us. Like we NBA players, we're all not prime. He's got like, yo man, who this damn skinny ass <laughs> white dude. Dirk's got like 30, 31 at halftime. And Scott and Pippen, like, I got him in the second half. I got him. And Dirk Pins are like 50. <laughs> and I was like, yo, man, who the hell are you? And he's, he's just like, I'm Dirk Nowitzki, blah, blah, blah. He said, I said, yo, man, how much money you want to come to Auburn? He said, <laughs> he's like, no, he's like, I got to go in the Army. I said, yo, man, you're seven feet tall. They're not, your ass not going in the Army. And uh, I got I got all his contact and everything. And, I, and Nike called me like a couple months later and like he got drafted. Um, and I was like, oh, man, that I would have loved him at Auburn. But – no, I don't want to say you were thing. nil before nil. Hey, brother, I just want Auburn. To, I, I just, hey, I just want Auburn to be good. Can you imagine? I don't even mind Dirk breaking all my records. He would have been great at Auburn. Yeah, you know, we you know what's crazy, and I hate to say this about the guy because he was a really good dude, but he passed away. Robert tracked the trailer. Yeah, you know, people don't even realize this that the Mavs didn't even draft Dirk, and if you look at it. And that's probably going to go down. Like I said, Robert was a great kid and a good player. But if you look at it from a con- serious standpoint, that's probably going to go down as one of the worst trades ever. You know, that's going to go down as one of the worst trade ever. Uh, but Robert was a good dude. I hate to talk back. He passed away a few years ago. Good dude, good player. But trading Robert tracked the trailer for Dirk Nowitzki is going to go down. That's got to be one of the worst trades in the history of civilization. Well, you also had the one the Celtics did with uh... – was that Joe Barry Carroll? And they ended up getting Robert Parrish and Kevin McHale for Joe Barry Carroll. Yeah, that's a bad one, too. That's also, a real bad one. Also, Kevin, the Sixers, they're what they got for you when they traded you to Phoenix. That wasn't very good. Well, they got four good players. Mm, nice. You're being, you're being friendly, complimentary. Damn, they got four players. What else do you want, Dan? <laughs> well, they, they, he may need a few more good ones, though. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what do you do today on an off day in Minnesota? Yeah, Dan, I need to talk to you about your show. You got to start doing your show later. I'm not used to getting up <laughs> early. I was, th- hey, Dan, I want to tell you that before we like, damn, Dan, I'm only up this early. Okay. Right? So this, I, so this, so, hey, I'm going right back to bed. Okay. Uh, but no, uh, so I got to do your show. I got to do two podcasts. I got um, one of my friends from Philly is a guy named Mike Messinelli. I'm going to do his podcast. And I got a girl from Phoenix. Her name is Cameron. I'm doing a podcast with her. And then uh, I got two friends I got to get together with today, uh, Jesse Ventura. Oh, and Ezra, look at you. And I got another friend who lives here named Ezra Tuawello. I hope I pronounce his name right. Ezra is a really good friend of mine. I, I I I forget. I, I keep pronouncing his name. Name ain't good. Tuarello, I think his name. Wait, is. wait. Jessica. He's a really good friend, but you can't pronounce his name. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's, cause I, don't, it, well, I, I call it. You know. You know. Uh, I I think that he's Samoan. I think he's a so really good friend. Yeah, defensive Ezra, line. I, 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 Ezra is easy. Yeah. Tuarello. Tuarello. <laughs> now, who in the hell is calling my room? Now, no. Hey, see, this is this is somebody I don't know. This because you're for, under an alias. I'm under an alias. Okay. And, and I like, and my phone never rings in the room. Could it be Shaq? No, Shaq. No, no. Shaq would call me. He, first of all, I have to uh, I have to tell Shaq all the time. The dudes don't FaceTime each other. <laughs> he always FaceTimes me. Yeah. 
I'm like, dude, we're men. Men don't FaceTime each other. That's stuff women do. Men don't FaceTime each other. You know who does that all the time is Dan Lebitard. Oh, I love Dan. Dan. You know, he's so, his, you know, I love Dan. His mom is the sweetest lady in the world. His dad, old fat ass dad. Yeah. I want every time I see him, I want to punch him in the face. <laughs> I, don't, I do. But his mom, his mom is a saint. Yeah. Miss Lourdes is a saint. But his fat ass daddy, he takes shots at me all the time. <laughs> and I just want to punch him in the face. I really want to punch him in the face. Wait, you want to punch him in the face or Skip Bayless if you had to choose? Oh, man. That's how it's like me to choose between oatmeal raisin and white chocolate <laughs> macadamia nut cookies. Those are my two favorite cookies in the world. <laughs> white chocolate macadamia or oatmeal. Damn. It'd probably be Skip Bayless. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go with the white chocolate macadamia nut. That's the best cookie ever created other than oatmeal raisin. Have fun. No, but, Thank you yeah. for getting up. Thank you for getting up. No, Dan. You know I got man. I'm telling you, man. You know I got a lot of love for you, and thank you for thank you for having me. Tell them nerds you work with. Uh, hey, hello. nerds. Charles says hello. Yeah, they. Hi, Charles. Yeah, they're, they're waving. Hey, who else you got on the show today? Uh, just really you. Wait, Dan. Who else you got on the show today? Just you. That's okay. it. Okay. That's how good you are. Stand alone. I don't want anybody to go. I don't know if it was Charles who said it, or you know, if it was Steve Smith who said it. I don't know if it was Chris Weber or t- – no, just you. And, hey, Dan. Uh, we got I, the, the I, four guys you were traded for will join us next hour. Hey, Dan, if you want me to buy you drinks and take you to dinner, you better get to me soon while I still got a job. <laughs> but after that, <laughs> I'm not buying anything, any drinks or dinner once I get fired. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck.